Who is set to make a statement this college football season? I'm so glad you asked. We're about to talk about it and unpack that just a little bit more. But welcome to the hard count. We talk college football every single day. You are a junkie for this sport just like we are. So we're glad to have you here. Make sure you're subscribed. We're on the air right now. We are typically live every Tuesday, every Thursday. I'm currently out of the office. But if you thought for a second... We were going to leave y'all without a show. You must have been out of your mind. If you watch on YouTube, like I said, we're typically live right now. If you're listening on podcast, anything changed for you? We're glad to have you a part of this. Like I said, we're about to talk about some uh, some statement teams here for the 2023 season. But I also want to talk about who else is holding keys to the college football playoff. We talked about this on Tuesday's show, and I told you, I preface it just a little bit. We were going to have to unpack a volume two with this piece because there's a lot of variables that play into this. So who holds the keys to the college football playoff? We're going to unpack that one some more as well. Florida State. Those Florida State boys, man, there is a lot of excitement around that team this coming season. A lot of people predicting them to maybe be a college football playoff team, maybe run the table in the ACC. I don't know. Got the most trending production in college football. Might as well get after it while you got Jordan Travis at quarterback and Jared Verse back for another year. A lot of juice in Tallahassee for good reason. We'll predict their record from a win-loss total a little bit later in this show. At the end of this deal, we were privileged to sit down with the man, the myth, the legend, the head football coach at Texas Tech, Coach Joey McGuire. I was fortunate to be around him for a very brief period of time while I was a player at Baylor. And I mean very, very brief, like 15 minutes, cup of coffee kind of brief. But that dude, I'm telling you what, they're doing something special in Lubbock. And he was extremely transparent and open with us about their process, the way they're doing things. And I've said this before, I will say it again. Oklahoma and Texas, they're leaving for the SEC. And Texas Tech, I would be surprised if they're not the top, if not one of the top teams when it comes to the team recruiting rankings, the all three industry team recruiting rankings, that is, for this 2024 cycle and maybe even years to come. Like people want to play for Joey McGuire. He creates buy-in. Excited for y'all to hear that conversation. If you're on podcast, welcome. If you're watching on YouTube, welcome. We got a streak going here of 100 likes before we get off the air. Would love to keep that rolling. So I already know what's going to happen. So I'm going to thank y'all in advance for that. Little thumbs up under the picture. Appreciate you. Okay, we can't waste too much more time. Let's jump into it. Who is set to make a statement this coming season in the college football landscape. There's a lot of teams we got to talk about, but I think the team that probably comes to mind first when I was sitting down to craft this segment, the Texas Longhorns, man. I think the sentiment you'd like to leave or the, or the statement you'd like to make if you're a Texas Longhorn fan or maybe internally at Texas is that you have to deal with us when it comes to you know talking about the college football playoff and the conference championship race and the Big 12 and the SEC. Like There's so much about Texas that has been brewing now for a couple of years. It's year three for Sark. We say it all the time on here. There's no more excuses that you're making. This is the year where you say, okay, our window's here. We got an experienced quarterback. We got a year three culture. We got a bunch of weapons on the outside. Xavier Worthy, Isaiah Nayor, A.D. Mitchell. Like, you know the drill. They got a lot of pieces there. This is the year for them to really show what they're going to be under Steve Sarkeesian. And I put a poll out on my Twitter page, at J.D. Pakel at the end of last week. And I asked... Would a Big 12 title mean Texas is back? And a lot of y'all, to my surprise, were like, no. The majority of that vote was no. That's not what means Texas is back. And I think a lot of Texas fans actually even chimed in and agreed on that. And so I just say that to make sure that I, I, I'm clear in the sense that this is a big building block year. Like this is the start of the new foundation. So much of what Steve Sarkeesian has done at Texas has been working to get Texas out of the hole that they were in and now getting them to a place where they can compete for what they want to compete for. And this is that year where you take the first step, taking back what you believe is yours at Texas. So a Big 12 title, I think, is attainable. But for, for Texas, the statement they're trying to make is, you now have to deal, deal with us when you talk about teams that are competing for things across the college football landscape. No more, Texas is down, Texas is you know a thing of the past. Like I'm, I'm not here to say Texas is back. But I do think they're somewhere in the middle, and you'd like to believe they're somewhere past the midway point after the results of this coming season. So Texas, absolutely a statement team in 2023. Really quickly, you already know what I'm going to say. Make sure you're subscribed to this channel because we talk ball every day, and you love ball, we love ball. It's a great deal. Make sure you like the video. 
Make sure you follow me on the socials at Jody Paquel. Twitter, Instagram, you can find me there. Thank you in advance for that. We're moving right along right now. Let's go to the SEC, where Texas is actually about to be. And let's take a look at the Alabama Crimson Tide. They are 1 million percent a statement team when it comes to this coming season. And the statement they would like to make is, did you forget about us? I think even more so, they'd like to say, how did you forget about us? They want to remind everybody that Bama is still Bama. And listen, it wouldn't be a statement so much, I think, for for everyone that's tuned into this show, because y'all know we're not looking past Bama this year. We think Bama is still going to be Bama. But they want to remind a lot of people in other circles in the SEC that Nick Saban hasn't lost his touch at all. Like, yes, Georgia's back-to-back national champs. No one's taken that away from them. But I think for Alabama, if they were to get back to the college football playoff, I think that would send a very clear message to everyone else. The statement would be very clear. We're not going anywhere. You really forget about us? Really? You thought that we were just going to fade quietly into that good night? You, you must not know what we're about here at Bama. You must not know what we've built this thing on. You must not know how we've recruited so well over the past few years. Getting back to bully ball, it's going to be a big piece of it for Bama to make that statement. But they are absolutely a team looking to make a statement. I think very, very, very reasonably could make a statement in 2023. Tennessee, another statement team. And they're sort of on the other end of the spectrum here where you talk about teams looking to arrive. And that's kind of the statement I think they want to make. Tennessee wants to allow the entire world to know we are here, we are for real. Because there's so much made about what Hendon Hooker was and what Jalen Hyatt was and the run they had last year and they beat Bama and they stormed the field, tried to throw some goalposts into the river. Turns out they don't float. Like that was kind of the good story that people like to talk about with Tennessee last year. But they say, okay, that happened. But now Hendon Hooker, he's gone. You got Joe Milton stepping in. Hope you don't think he's changing the game for you. That's what they want to say. I'm telling you this. I I think Joe Milton will be a game changer for Tennessee. And I think to make that statement that you are for real and that wasn't just a one-year wonder and that wasn't just a, you know, you had the right pieces for, you know, one magical year and this thing is going to have some staying power, I think you need to be either Alabama or Georgia this coming season. You got to be one of those teams because that would solidify, hey, listen, you got to talk about us with the top tier in the SEC. You got to talk about us now as as one of those top teams. We are for real, like I just mentioned a minute ago. I also think double-digit wins, if you could make that happen, that would also cater to the idea that you are a for real operation. And I think they are, to be transparent. I believe in Josh Heupel. I believe in the system they run. I believe in the culture that I've been able to gauge from what they do there. I believe in how they're recruiting. Like I'm bought in on Tennessee now. I think it's just going to be a matter of taking it to the field and executing. Again, taking down one of the big boys, From a brand perspective, Alabama and Georgia, get one of them like you did last year. I think that would give you a lot of credibility and prove that you are for real in Knoxville. How about another team looking to make a statement? A team that is, in my mind at least, and for a lot of y'all, synonymous with one of those premier brands in college football. It's kind of on its way back in some ways. I say on its way back. The Notre Dame Fighting Irish. When I say on its way back, I mean, you think about Notre Dame and historically, like, a little more historically than some of us want to remember, they're a team that has competed for national championships. I mean, they haven't done it super, super recently. But I I just want to make sure that there's an understanding of what Notre Dame has been in the past. And Marcus Freeman steps into that and says, no, no, no. Just because we haven't been there super recently, that's still the standard here at Notre Dame. I don't care about you know how difficult it is to get into school here and the ways that we're hamstrung by being in South Bend, Indiana. Like, we're... We're still one of those teams that is going to compete for everything that everybody else is competing for nationally. Like they're looking to make it very, very clear. They're going to abide by the standard that has been set historically for Notre Dame. They're not running from it. They're not worried about not being in a conference. If you don't believe me, look at Marcus Freeman and what he did going out and grabbing Sam Hartman. A sentiment we have talked about many times on this show. Nobody forced Marcus Freeman to go get Sam Hartman. He had his starting quarterback from a year ago coming back. Nobody would have batted an eye if they came into week one with Tyler Buckner as a starting quarterback. But even so, he says, no, 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 no. I think we can get better. I think we have a guy that we can bring in and can compete and help us elevate our game. Goes out and grabs the best transfer portal quarterback available and ACC's all-time touchdown pass leader 
and is going to elevate them. Now, a big part of them making this statement that the standard isn't changed, that they're still trying to achieve what they've achieved historically, is going to be having an alpha playmaker on the outside step up. I think that's going to be a big piece of it. But even so, credit Marcus Freeman and company for doing what they have said they were going to do and challenging everything and recruiting at a top 10 level, they're, they're pushing the envelope here, and I respect the heck out of Marcus Freeman for it. So keep an eye on Notre Dame. They are absolutely looking to make a statement in 2023. Last team I want to talk about here, the Penn State Nittany Lions. The statement they want to make is kind of similar to Tennessee, but for Penn State, their statement is, you better mention us. And when I say you better mention us, when you talk about those teams in the Big Ten that are like the big boys, right? The Ohio States, the Michigans. Those are teams that you better include us in the same breath with. And they have the roster to do it. We had Sean Fitz on from Blue White Illustrated not too long ago, and we were just talking about how it's no longer a thing for Penn State where they're trying to you know, overcome the roster they don't have next to those teams. Like You look at how they've recruited. Look at some of those cats they got already on campus that it made an impact for them as freshmen. Nick Singleton, Abdul Carter. like Those dudes can play now. There's no wondering about what will they eventually be. If you're wondering about what they will eventually be, you're wondering about how many times they'll make an All-American team. Because you know they're going to be players for you. You know they're going to be all-conference guys for you. That should be a given. I think when you look at this team, a lot of the pressure, as we've mentioned many times before on this show, lies with Drew Aller. Drew Aller is so talented, he has the potential to unlock more talent within this roster, if that makes sense. Like, when I have a talented quarterback, and I'm worried about the field being stretched as a defensive coordinator, I might lighten the box a little bit. You don't want to lighten the box with Nick Singleton playing running back for you, Katron Allen playing running back for you. Like, it's a thing where now they're so balanced and have more explosivity available to them if Drew Aller is who we believe he will be. Penn State's in that tier where they're saying, you've you've talked a lot about Michigan and Ohio State being those top two. Talk about us now. You better mention us. That's the statement they want to make, and I absolutely love them for it. Penn State, man, one of those teams that I get excited about talking about because I I truly believe in the way they've built to it and the depth they have right now. And so I'm just curious to see if they're able to make that statement in 2023. And a lot of it does reside with the the progression of Drew Aller, especially early on in the year. So teams looking to make a statement. To recap it for you, Texas, not trying to say they're back. That's not what this year is about. It's about taking that step forward and making it clear to everybody else, you got to deal with us here at Texas. Yeah, we're leaving the Big 12, we're going to the SEC, but you got to deal with us here for years to come. For Alabama, you really forget about us? Is that the thing? Are you sure you want to go that you want to go that route with us? I wouldn't, but all right. We'll try and remind you here. Tennessee, sustained success. Proving you're for real. That's the statement they're trying to make. Notre Dame, standard is the standard. It's been the same way for a long time. History is history, but we're not falling back just because we haven't won a national title in a minute here. We're, we're still striving for those things. Do not get it twisted. For Penn State, like we were just saying, they want to be mentioned with those top teams in the Big Ten. And I think they have every opportunity to do it here in 2023. Appreciate everybody tuned in live right now. Again, we're on the air. If you think we're ever going to leave you without a show on a Tuesday or a Thursday, we're not going to do that. We're, we're, just, we're, we're not going to do that. I've listened to some podcasts about you know, different content creators and, and listen to different content creators that I respect. And I think that the overall theme for us here in terms of the interaction we want to have with y'all is like this thing right here from the camera or whether you're listening on podcast and you're, and you're hearing us like this back and forth we have, I feel like there is more than just a, like a, an audience to content relationship. It's like a, a friendship. And listen here, we, we always show up for our friends, all right? So I'll just leave it at that. Make sure you subscribe. Make sure you like the video, all that. But I promise you, we will never leave you hanging without a show, all right? Appreciate you in advance for that. Let's keep on rolling here. Keep it on rolling. Talked about it on Tuesday's show. Let's, let's uh, break down some more of these who holds the keys to the college football playoff. Volume two, if you will. And the place that I want to start is in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Jaden Daniels and company, man. LSU is going to be the favorite for a lot of people to win that side of the SEC. They did it last year. Like, they might, might go for it again. It was Brian Kelly's first year. It was Jaden Daniels' first year at LSU. Like, why the heck not, right? It's a fair thought process to have. I think the big variable for me, the key I'm looking at with Jaden Daniels and LSU, is Jaden Daniels able to take that next step? Like, he, if he's... 
I get excited talking about this, so bear with me here. If he's able to push the ball downfield, and not able to so much as willing to push the ball downfield, able to take that 50-50 shot and trust his guy, then as a secondary, as a defense, you have to honor that. And you got to take some guys out of run support because you know Jay Daniels will pull the trigger. And so when you take guys out of run support, what does that do? Well, it gives you more space to then run the football, something LSU did really well at times last year. And when LSU was able to run the football well, especially in the read option game, that offense was rolling. Like that was when they turned a corner in my mind. That old Miss game comes comes to mind when you talk about LSU turning the corner. Um, gosh, what else? The, the Alabama game when they ran the football effectively at times. Like that really is who LSU I think wants to be. But again, to create that picture, you got to have a quarterback that's willing to push the ball downfield. And willing to is where it starts. And after you're willing to do it, you got to connect on it. And I think they have the tools to do it. And I think those are the conversations they're having with Jaden Daniels right now. I mean, Brian Kelly came on this very show and talked about it. So for LSU and Jaden Daniels, pushing the ball downfield. It sounds simple, has a big ripple effect for what LSU could do in 2023 if they want to get to the college football playoff. Because that defense is going to be nasty now. Defense is going to be nasty. They've proven they can hang with just about anybody. I'm excited to see how they look in their second year under Brian Kelly and how that culture looks in terms of being the same team week in and week out. We've talked about that before, but that's something I'm looking to see for them. Make sure you're subscribed. Make sure you're locked in. Not going to waste too much more time. Thank you in advance for that. All right. Also, make sure you like the video. Again, 100 likes. That's the goal. So let's keep it rolling now. Thank you in advance for that. All right. Florida State, man. We're going to talk about them here in just a minute in terms of what their record's going to be in 2023. I'm going to give you a prediction here in just a minute if you're tuned into the podcast, the full podcast, or the full live show. But for Florida State, man, my big question lies in their approach. How do they handle the bright lights? I don't have a ton of questions about personnel with them. Like they have the number one returning production in the country. Bring back like 90 plus percent production of a defense that only allowed like 21, 22 points a game. They're going to be really good defensively. You bring back the quarterback, Jordan Travis. He was awesome last year. They scored 35 points a game. How do they handle though a full off season of people talking about them, of people picking them to be in the college football playoff? Like this is new territory for this team. It is. They won double digit games a year ago, but going into last year, a lot of people were saying, I don't know if Mike Norvell is the guy, man. They missed a bowl game last year. Like, I know we're building to it. He's working through the portal, and they're trying to get it back to you know being where we expect to be. But like, I just I don't know about Florida State. And then they popped off. Now nobody's nobody's you know going to be surprised if Florida State comes out and wins double digit games. That's the expectation. I'm curious to see how they handle that from a psyche perspective. I believe in Mike Norvell. I think he's the absolute man. But that's going to be key for Florida State because everything they want to do is available to them in terms of the personnel. The personnel won't limit them, in my opinion. Two huge games. Week one against LSU in Orlando on a Sunday. That will be a movie if it's anything like what we saw last year. And then the game at Clemson. Both, if I'm not mistaken, are very early in the year. I believe Clemson is week four. So those first four games for, for Florida State are going to you know really shape their season. Especially in the ACC race in that game against Clemson. So that'll be crucial. But handling the bright lights, man, that is my big question when it comes to Florida State and them getting to where they want to go, which is obviously the college football playoff and beyond that to the national title. Now, speaking of Clemson, a lot of people just kind of looking past Clemson this year. You know, I mean, Clemson for the first time is kind of playing that that underdog role going into this season. And a lot of people will put Clemson in the underdog role once the season gets going, but for the most part, they're usually one of those teams that you talk about making a run at it, and, and the ACC not being that strong. Well, that's not the case this year, man. North Carolina's got Drake May. We just told you about Florida State. I think NC State's even going to be halfway decent. Clemson's going to have their work cut out for them, but the thing that I love about the team, the way they're built, this defense, man. Defense is solid. 75% of the production back from a season ago. I think Barrett Carter is going to be one of the best backers in the country. Dude's an absolute man child they allowed 22 points a game last year and like I just said three-fourths of the production of that defense is back so the defense thing is gonna be solid my big question for Clemson is does Cade Klubnick and Garrett Riley click 
And when I mean by click, I don't mean personally do they get along. I don't have any reservations about that. I think from what I've heard, they're both pretty outstanding human beings. So that's one piece of it. But the other piece of this is if Clemson is able to be explosive offensively, be able to push the ball downfield offensively, that's going to apply some pressure to some teams. That's going to force some teams to kind of have to answer scores, if you will. And I don't know that teams are going to be able to do that against Clemson with this defense. Because I believe in this defensive unit. I'm just curious if Cade Klubnik is the upgrade that a lot of people believe he's going to be. To be to be transparent, I believe it's going to work. I think it's going to be great. I believe in Cade Klubnik. My question, though, is how quickly and how effectively does it click? Because a lot of people last year, if you had a gripe with Clemson, it was how explosive were they downfield. That's kind of, you know, multifaceted. A lot of people were quick, you know, quick to blame, excuse me, DJ Uwe Ungalale. And, I mean, I think you always have to give some blame to the quarterback. But I also look at the receiving core. you got to separate. Also look at the offensive game plan. we got to scheme stuff up so we can set up the defense and get explosive plays. Like, I don't think you just put the blame on DJU. And so that's the reason why my question is, do Cade Klubnik and Garrett Riley create some magic with scheming up explosive plays and by a result of that, scoring a whole lot of points? Because if they do now, it's going to be a very, very big deal for Clemson because then that puts the pressure back into the opposing offense and if the game is in your defense's hands I think nine times out of ten you feel really good if you're a Clemson Tiger fan so that's the big deal for Clemson and the things that you look at for last year the games they lost it felt like is when the offense kind of left the defense hanging right now it wasn't all the losses but there was a couple games where it felt like okay offense we're holding it down, we're holding it down, we're holding it down if we're on the defensive side. And then eventually, like, hey, man, you're going to leave us out there. If we can't get anything going, you know, there's got to be some balance here. So it's a long-winded way to tell you I think Cade Klubnik and Garrett Riley are going to click, and that is a huge key to the college football playoff. Because if you win the ACC, I think if you win the ACC even with one loss, I think you're in. Now, a lot of people, you know, a lot of things depend on, you know, where the rest of the – college football landscape stands but I think that'll be good enough so take that as you will when it comes to Clemson last key I want to talk about for the college football playoff we got to go out to the west coast now because Utah isn't getting talked about nearly enough and they've won the conference the last two years and we're all quick to talk about USC and for good reason right they got the Heisman Trophy quarterback coming back and Caleb Williams my question for Utah my question for the college football playoff is Utah still the bully out West? Like, are they still that troll under the bridge just saying nobody's getting past us? Because they were the last two years. Two consecutive seasons, they had a rematch in the Pac-12 title game and just made it look like child's play. Last year against USC, the year before against Oregon, and it was just like, we are the more physical, we are the more tough, we are the more organized operation. Like, you're not getting past us. In both those seasons, Utah didn't make it to the college football playoff. They were the bully out West. And did they have a perfect season? No, but they were for sure not letting you get back the conference crown. That was how Utah operated last year. But the reason why this is a question for me, if Utah's not that bully anymore, well, then there's some teams now that can pass through that bridge that the troll is no longer under. USC is the most obvious one. Oregon with Bo Nix back. If they're able to be better on, in the secondary defensively, like that could change things. Washington, y'all, I don't know if we're all on the same page here. Washington, I think, could very well be a top 10 team through the first month of the season. Like Michael Penix Jr. back, that offense was explosive. There's a lot of firepower here in the Pac-12. Now it could just be gladiator style and they all just beat each other up and that's the way it goes and nobody gets out again. But I'll just say this, Utah, the question mark for me is how does Cam Rising respond to that injury? And I'm not talking about response like how does he emotionally respond. I'm talking about is he able to get back to the version of himself that Utah needs to win the Pac-12 again and be a college football playoff team. Because Cam Rising does so much for that team. I mean, even running the football, he is a force for them last year. So Utah being that bully, it's going to be a big part of it. I'll even say this too. If Utah is that bully and they win the Pac-12 with one loss, or dare I say they win the Pac-12 and go undefeated, just run the table... They just decide to flex their muscle this year, and Cam Rising says, nope, I'm him. I'm bouncing back from the ACL. Like, 
then Utah could be a college football playoff team. So you see where I'm going with this? This is a key to the college football playoff because if Utah gets overthrown, the door is open for some teams to, to make it to the big dance. So I'm excited to see that. So that's the, the volume two version of these keys to the college football playoff. To recap it for you, Jane Daniels, take another step. Florida State handling the limelight. Kate Klubnick and Garrett Riley click in, create an explosive place for Clemson. Good things could happen because then you feed the defense some desperate offenses on the other side of things. So that'd be a good way for Clemson to live. Is Utah still the bully out West? I don't know, but I can't wait to find out because if they are, they could be in the playoff. And if they're not, there's some other teams in the Pac-12 that I think have a very real shot to get in there. USC being the one that I think is the most obvious. So we'll leave it at that for you. Man, I'll say that it's never too early to talk about the college football playoff. Like practically, yes, it's early, but I mean, it's it's what you play for, right? Like you, you play to be a national champion. Nobody walks into the season and says, oh, I hope our team is just good enough. Hope we're just average. Now, I'll also bring this caveat. Not all teams are in the same position, but I'm just saying nobody is aspiring to mediocrity long term. Like maybe you're in a rebuild year. Maybe you hope you make a bowl game. Yes, that's a real thing, but that's not like where you want to be long term. It's a checkpoint. And so we talk about the playoff here early in the year because our data has shown that y'all care about it. And so if y'all care about it, we care about it. I think the college football playoff is fun. So that's uh, my soapbox, I suppose, for the time being. All right, really quickly, make sure you're subscribed. If you're on the podcast now, we appreciate you because you're locked in and you're not able to make the show live. So you're like, no, listen, it'd be easy to say I'll catch the next show. It'd be easy to say I'm not going to listen to this one. I'll be there next week. Like, no, 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 no. If you're in the podcast, you're in the trenches with us, we love you and we appreciate you. And if you're on YouTube, you already know how I feel about you. All right, so thank you in advance for that. Before we get to this next segment, let me know whether Twitter DM, Instagram DM, both at Jody Piquel, or in the live chat or in the comment section, how and where do you listen? Because we've been collecting these answers and it's been a ton of fun to hear from y'all. We've heard some of y'all say you're working during your summer internship and doing yard work and you got us in on the podcast passing time we've heard some of y'all being truck drivers and you're you're listening on the route had one of y'all hit me up in the dms the other day and say you're in sales and you're on the road a lot and you got us going in the car so like however you listen in however you get it done we love you and we appreciate you and we genuinely are very glad to have you a part of this community all right roll party roll okay now let's talk about florida state Talked about the playoff, talked about a team that wants to make the playoff in Florida State. Now they have raised the bar tremendously on what they are expecting in 2023. It's scheduled prediction season, and we're going to go ahead and predict what we think the final record will be for Florida State. Now, I'll just say this, Florida State, kind of like we alluded to earlier in the show, it's all right there for them. You know, like like everything that Florida State wants to accomplish is on the table because of what they have personnel-wise. I had one of you in one of our previous live shows get at me and say, hey, JD, for week one, what's Florida State's weakness? And of course, we're live, so we're kind of on the spot and we're thinking through it. But I even thought about that even after the live show, and I was like, man, I don't know if I could really pick one definitive weakness for Florida State. Like there's some areas that are stronger than others, but you look across the board here, Number one returning production in the country. Bring back 90 plus percent of a defense that allowed 21 points a game last year. They scored 35 a game. You bring back the quarterback. Like there's a lot to be excited about at Florida State for that reason. So the roster and then the culture is also the thing that you can't really totally quantify. You can't really flip on the tape and say, yeah, great culture. But when I look at what this team accomplished a year ago, there was some high culture moments. I mean, Florida State lost some games they didn't expect to lose, and they could have very easily buried their head in the sand and say, you know what, good run to start the year, boys. We'll get them next year. No, got right back on the winning side of things after that little, you know, fall off. They they got back on and finished the year and won 10 games that year. Like, they should be very, very proud of what they accomplished in 2022. Now, I say they should be proud. You're not here to be told you should be proud. But what I'm saying is the way that Florida State responded last year and what they have coming back, gives me a lot of encouragement and optimism about the culture they have internally. I said it on a previous one-off video. Maybe it was a live show, but I just said, like, I don't have to question what I've got in this locker room at Florida State. 
coaches talk so often about having to reset every single year. Like, Florida State's not hitting the reset button. They're throwing a welcome back party for all the guys that are back on this roster. And oh, by the way, they sprinkled in some big time transfers with Keon Coleman, Jaheim Bell, Fentrell Cypress. Like, they got some dudes now. They got some dudes they added to the roster they already knew, and now there's excitement because of what's in front of you, because of who you have on this roster, and because of the culture that you're building upon. You're not hitting the reset on the culture. The culture is there. Culture is there, and it's fueling them forward. So that's the first part of this. But the road ahead is not going to be easy by any stretch. So before we talk about that, I'll know the drill. Make sure you're subscribed right here. Florida State fans love to have you a part of this operation. We've had a ton of y'all join us in the last couple of weeks, so thank you for that. If you're new, we're glad to have you. Hit that subscribe button. No time like the present. Also, be sure to like the video, okay? Thank you in advance for that. Follow me on the gram. Follow me on Twitter, at JD Paquel. A lot of interaction to be had on there, okay? So thank you. Like I was saying, the gauntlet for Florida State is very front-heavy. LSU week one, man, it's a playoff game, essentially. And then you play Clemson at Clemson week four. Two enormous games that will impact the complexion of Florida State season. Those are the two that you have circled. So I'll just say this for Florida State. Even if you lose one of those games, the LSU loss, if you were to lose that game, I don't think totally sinks your chances. Now you need some help. And that'd be the annoying thing. You then would need some help. But if you lose that game and then lose to Clemson, then I think you're out. So my sentiment I'm trying to say here is I don't know that you... I think they're both playoff games. I'll say it that way. I think they're both playoff games because you then lose control of your own destiny. That's never what you want to do. But if you lose one of them, it's not necessarily over. Does that make sense? I hope we're on the same page here. The, the thing I want to talk about, though, is if you lose to Clemson, you might have to play Clemson again. If you beat Clemson, you might have to play Clemson again. So, like, that game at Clemson is going to be a very big tone setter. But I'm just saying that's going to be one to, to really watch to see how this ACC race shakes up. We're going to do a prediction a little bit later, a little closer to the season of, like, our whole big picture college football playoff and you know who wins what conference. But I'll just say this, the Florida State-Clemson game early on, is going to be a very, very telling matchup for how that conference shakes out. So here's my concern for Florida State. And I talked about it a little bit earlier in the show. This is a season where a lot of hype has been heaped on the Knolls. And off-season hype to me is a lot like hanging out in the sun. Like at first it feels good. At first you're like, yes, this is nice. The rays are just hitting my skin. I'm soaking it in. It feels good. But if you stay out in the sun too long and you don't understand how that impacts you, it could be bad news. All right, trust me. I know from, from, from experience, I know it's bad news. So you have to take the proper measures to protect yourself from that. You got to put in the work. You got to put on some sort of sun hack, put on some sunscreen, like whatever you got to do to make sure you keep the main thing the main thing. And that's the thing I'm curious about with Florida State. They haven't had this much hype around them in a minute now. And I didn't say they didn't always have high expectations for themselves or there wasn't high expectations for the fan base. But you got a lot of people in the spring right now, or I guess we're in the summer now, technically, in the summer and in the spring, picking Florida State to be a college football playoff team. And they've earned the right to do that. But that hasn't been the case so far for Mike Norvell. There hasn't been this much hype under Mike Norvell's time in Tallahassee. Like last year, they popped. But before that, going into the year, it was like, hey, is Mike Norvell the guy? That was, that was the narrative. Is Mike Norvell the guy at Florida State? And now we know that I think he is the guy for the foreseeable future. They just won 10 games, and they're in a really exciting position right now. But this is new, is what I'm trying to tell you. This hype, this excitement, it's new for this locker room. It's a new thing. So how do they handle that? That's going to be the determining factor, because I don't have questions about the roster. I don't have questions about the roster. So when I look at the way this thing is going to go for a win-loss prediction for you I think the floor the absolute floor in my mind is nine and three I'm going to go ahead and predict Florida State to finish the regular season at 11 and one like I said I think if you split LSU and Clemson you're in good position now a lot of y'all are saying well what about the college football playoff JD tell us about that 
That's going to come down to the ACC title game, and I think you see Clemson again there. Okay, so again, make sure you're locked in and subscribed here because we're going to predict that here in the coming months and like the, the pretty pretty near future coming months. But again, I, I think that you're going to be right in position that conference championship weekend to have a chance at it, which is all you can ask for in my mind. The big caveat, the way they can really get this done and not the weakness, but the thing that I think could really put them over the hump for Florida State. They scored 35 points a game last year. That's really good. Like, that's really, really good. You don't think Iowa would kill to score 35 points a game last year? The Iowa fans, to see that many points on their scoreboard, they would do egregious things. Okay? So that's one piece of this. But the teams that made the college football playoff, all four of those teams, what do they have in common? They averaged 40 points a game. So 35 is a lot. But to be elite, to get to where you want to go, I think you need to have even more firepower offensively. Now, the good news for Florida State fans, you say bring it on because we got Keon Coleman and we got Jaheim Bell. We feel good about Jordan Travis taking another step. We feel good about the offensive line. Like There's a lot of excitement around the personnel you have here. I didn't even mention, I didn't even mention Benson playing running back for you. They feel good about what they have personnel-wise and the way they've upgraded, and I do too. But that's the number I really want us to all Kind of keep an eye on together. 40 points a game. If they can do that, that means they've done enough firepower-wise offensively to be considered in one of the elite tiers offensively, which I think is what it takes, quite frankly, to compete to what you want to compete to for Florida State. So, again, prediction, 11-1. and one. Get to the ACC title game, and we'll see what happens there. Right now, we'll assume you play Clemson which would be the second round, but Florida State, man, to go 11-1, and one, not too shabby at all, if that were to be the case. Appreciate everybody tuned in live right now. So we got the, the privilege to sit down with Texas Tech head coach Joey McGuire. And I'll say this, he was a high school football coach in the state of Texas. He was an assistant coach at Baylor. And he is one of those people that you sit down with him and talk with him, even just being around him. He gives you his undivided attention, and, and you feel better for talking to him, which kind of sounds weird to say out loud, but in my own experience, here's how I got to meet Coach McGuire. He's an assistant at Baylor. I'm a walk-on graduate transfer. Okay, so they can't develop me because I'm there for one year. I'm not on scholarship, so they didn't come out and find me and say, hey, we want you to be here. Walked-on graduate transfer. So to put to put it on the totem pole, and I, this isn't self-deprecating, this is just the truth, like the level of investment someone should have had in me at that point in time, like pretty minimal, right? Because they're not going to develop me and they're not paying for my school. Like I'm there because I want to be there and I love college football, like a whole other story. Coach McGuire, man, whenever I saw him in the hallways or in the team room or we ever had any interaction, you would have thought I was a five-star plus recruit the way that he talked to me. Like has a way of making people feel valued and important. And I'll just tell you this, man, I think that's going to impact Texas Tech with him now being the guy calling the shots down there, I think that's going to rub off on the recruiting trail in a very big way. Like, I think recruits can sense what's real. There's a lot made about NIL and, and kids wanting NIL bags, and there's kind of that whole narrative out there, and, you know, maybe that's true in one-off cases. But I think for the most part, man, yes, kids want to make good NIL decisions, but I also think at the end of the day, real relationships, which is what Texas Tech talks about, I think that plays a really big factor. And that's one of the reasons why I think Texas Tech is going to be one of the top teams in the country, in the Big 12 at least, when it comes to the on-three industry team recruiting rankings with Texas and OU leaving. So without further ado, we had a great conversation with him. He talked us through his process, his strategy, and what he's doing at Texas Tech. And, I mean, quit hearing from me about it. Here's the head coach of Texas Tech, Coach Joey McGuire. Very excited to now be joined by the head coach of Texas Tech, Coach Joy McGuire. Coach, how are we doing today? It's a little bit toasty out there in Texas, I'd imagine. Yeah, we're doing great, man. Uh, right in the middle of summer one, we got our fourth uh, football school today. And so um, just ripping and tearing, man, trying to get ready for uh, week one in Wyoming. 
just a 365 day a year affair coach your background is at the high school level in the great state of texas and i think a lot of people when they hear that you were a high school coach in texas they think of friday night lights they think of the tv show in the movie i just got to ask how close in accuracy is that tv show slash movie to your life when you were coaching at the high school level well a lot of it depends on where you're at you know um but it's it it's a very similar um you know texas high school football yeah I, i'll never forget whenever i got the job at cedar hill um the superintendent came out in the dallas morning news which is you know the big biggest paper I, probably in texas but um, and he said the guy that, that they got rid of didn't win enough games, and that's why uh, he got fired. And so I was like, right then and there, I knew it's serious business. You better win games if you want to keep your job, you know, in Texas. I mean, it's it it's like that. I mean, I the last uh, state championship I won, we played in front of 54,000 at AT&T. And so uh, I, it's different. You know, it's uh, you spend some time in Texas, you know, man, it's uh, the the stadiums are bigger. The uh, uh, Friday night, they're tailgating. They're getting ready to to watch their high schools uh, play. Yeah, I mean, the saying everything's bigger in Texas is absolutely true. And high school football probably embodies that the best. But coach, you won a couple of state titles, not just one. And uh, we wanted to make sure we got that in there for you, because I don't think you'd say it yourself. But obviously now the head coach of Texas Tech and y'all have been just crushing it on the recruiting trail. What's gone into that for you and your staff? You know, we we really run it more, I think, like an NFL model, meaning we have a personnel department that really controls everything that we do. You know, traditionally, you're going to have a recruiting department or you're going to have some guys in your personnel department, and they're going to give you guys to watch, and that goes to the position coach, and he watches them, and then it goes to the coordinator, and he watches them, and then you usually watch them as a staff, and the process just takes – you know, depending on um, what time of year it is, the process takes, you know, it could take a week. It could take two weeks. It's, it just depends on who's driving that offer. Um, with us, our personnel department basically comes to me and says, hey, coach, this is who we've watched. Uh, here's all their measurables. Here's everything we can find uh, verified with them. This is who we want to go recruit. And so, when we first started doing that, the coordinators were like, now, hold on, you're telling me that we're not going to watch them? And I was like, well, no, you can, and we're going to. We're just not going to wait for you to tell us to offer them. Um, and, it, you know, Coach Ruder at first was like, man, that doesn't make a lot of sense. I said, I'll tell you what, Coach, every kid this next week that we're going to offer, I want you to watch, and you tell me if James Blanchard – uh, Brian Nance, Sean Kenny, uh, Jake Pittman, you tell them if, if they're wrong. You tell me one guy that you wouldn't say to offer. And at the end of the week, he was like, you're right. And I said, okay, guess what? You get to go coach football. And it's basically, hey, here's who we're going to recruit instead of, you know, having to process all this film and get ready for a game and coach the team that we have currently. And so it streams line, streams lines the process um, you definitely have to have some guys that you totally trust. And, you know, luckily we do. And so it keeps us ahead. We're developing relationships um, way before guys are offering. Usually we are either the first or second offer that a kid gets. I mean, if you track it, uh, most of the time, uh, the the world that you live in with on three and, and rivals and two, four, seven, they haven't even rated the kid and they've got a Texas Tech offer. And uh, it's just because we're able to streamline that because that group, all they do, they have student assistants with them. Each one of them have a student assistant. All they do when they come in this building, they watch film. That's it. And so I think we're we're getting ahead of the game and it gives us a chance to uh, really develop some really good relationships. Coach, you mentioned relationships. How big of a factor is it for you that you've been in the high school world and you have a lot of those relationships with some of those head coaches that I imagine you're talking to when you're recruiting these kids? Yeah, it's huge. You know, um, they know me. Uh, I tell everybody, and this is not like this slogan to make to help in recruiting, but I'm a high school coach and I, I, I get to coach college football. It's not the other way around. That's my DNA. Uh, when we won the bowl game, 
uh, Andre Ware, who I absolutely love. He played Texas high school football at Dickinson and then went on to a phenomenal career at Houston. He said, well, now maybe he'll, uh, in, in the TV copy, he said, maybe he'll look at himself as a college coach. I'm like, no, I get to coach college. I'm a high school coach. And, and so I think the respect of that game and the respect of the coaches, um, you know, that it helps. I mean, at the end of the day, you're still, you know, recruiting a high school athlete like you did probably the last five, 10, 15 years to where you've got to build relationships with the parents. The coaches got to know that you care about them. Uh, there's other people that are, have come in, um, you know, to that equation, but it, it's still at the end of the day, the high school coach has a, a big voice. And I would imagine for a lot of these kids, development has to be one of the the primary things they're considering when picking a school how big of a impact is it that you now can go and tell these kids hey come to texas tech and be a top 10 pick like tyree wilson was this past year oh, it's huge because if you go back and you look uh whenever i first got here the conversation that i had with tyree was man your grade is at best a fourth round of draft pick you know um you might go a little bit higher because you're measurables but this is what all the scouts are saying you should come back and for him to be able to turn around and go from there to playing in DeRuiter's defense. He's had back-to-back -back number one draft picks um, at the, on the edge position, you know, whenever he was at Oregon and, and now at Texas tech. And so it, it was huge. And I'm telling you, we feel like both of our uh, edge players, Miles Cole and Steve Linton, they'll both get drafted this next year. And so being able to develop those guys, and that is a huge word um, you know, we've been around each other and you kind of know my background. That is a huge word in this program of being able to develop. I really believe that our coaches are the best teachers. They should be the best teachers on campus. Um, if you believe in them and, and know that uh, you can bring in some guys that have really good numbers that have great length, that are good football players, then you ought to be able to turn them into great football players. And that's what we're trying to do. And one of those coaches you mentioned, Zach Kitley, the way that he's just risen through the ranks so quickly being at Western Kentucky and now calling the shots for y'all and over 30 points a game last year, pairing him with Tyler Shuck this coming season. What are your expectations for this team with with both Kitley and uh, Shuck playing on the offensive side of the ball? Well, you know, you started out, I don't know if we were on air yet, but you started out saying that you're the third smartest person in the room. We could put all of us in the room, and Zach Kitley is going to be the smartest person in the room. I mean, I'm going to tell you, you're talking about he's 30 years old, and he's as good, if not the best, offensive coordinator in the country. Um, we call him the wizard around here. I mean, he's he is so good. He does such a phenomenal job with quarterbacks. You're talking about development. You know, um, he did that with – zappy and and so um it, it's fun what's really fun when you talk to tyler is coach he, he'd be the first one to tell you this is the first time he's been in an offense in college and being in the same offense for consecutive years you know his college careers he's had a deep different offense every single year and so um he he's really excited he's got a he's got a grasp of the offense he's a tremendous leader right now if you're in the building um, probably somewhere around, somewhere around 10 o'clock, he's going to have the offensive skill guys in the staff room, and he's going through the install for today. Um, and that's how he is. You know, that's where he was in the fall. Um, he definitely was doing that whenever he finally got healthy at the end of the year. And um, and he's, he's, uh, he's a guy that whenever he gets um, in with NFL GMs and NFL coaches, he's going to blow them away as far as getting on the board and understanding the game. And, and that lends to the offense that we have and, and what coach Kitley can do with quarterbacks. And coach, when you talk about your team, it feels like a lot of people want to talk about Texas and Oklahoma's last year before they go to the sec and all the new pieces that are coming to the big 12. Do you feel kind of like there is a very well-kept secret in Lubbock right now? You know, we're, we're excited. You know, I, I do think Texas is going to be really good. I think Sark has put together a um, just dynamic offense. I mean, their, their receiving core is going to be really good. I haven't kept up with Oklahoma as much. I will. You know, we won't – we don't play them this year. And so, well, it'd have to be in the Big 12. And, man, I hope that happens. Uh, that would be good for both of us. 
Uh, but we we feel really good about our team. I mean, if you look at our team, um, besides our left guard, uh, Weston Wright and Sir Roderick Thompson, um, and and they Sir Roderick split with Taj. I think Taj actually started in the bowl game. And so we have 10 guys back on offense that started in the bowl game. You turn around and you look at the defense side of the ball, we have seven uh, of the 11 that started in the bowl game back. And so there's a lot of experience. Um, we had a, we had the fastest recruiting class in the country. We signed the fastest recruiting class in the country. And a couple of those guys are going to be able to help. And then we were able to add a couple of pieces in the transfer portal, you know, and that's really what we want to do. We don't want to live in the transfer portal. We want to add pieces to help the team. And we were able to do that. And so we feel like if you're in this building right now and you ask a player, and I'm sure you could say this about everywhere, but you look at our guys in the eye and you'll feel that they truly believe that they can win the Big 12, you know, and, and it's one of those deals of one reason is because we have so much experience back. Uh, we've got our, like I said, we got our fourth football school today. Uh, if you're down there on the offense side of the ball, you're going to be like, these dudes are ready to go play a game right now. Uh just the speed and the, the grasp that they have of the offense. So it's a lot of fun to be in West Texas right now. And, and uh, we've got some fans that are pretty fired up. And coach, I appreciate all your time. We want to get you out of here with this. I was able to be around you for what felt like 15 minutes when I was with Baylor. And one thing that I feel like you just embody so well is just culture, healthy culture, elevating everybody else in the room. And you talk a lot about the brand. What is the brand and explain to just our viewers what that is and what that means for Texas Tech? Well, first, man, I, I'm so proud of you, bro. Um, we, you know, I, we did have a great relationship and and I tried to with every one of my players, you know, and and uh, I was an assistant, but was st still trying to make an impact on the entire team because I love players. That's that's who I am. And every day I wake up, it's all about my guys. Um, the brand, <clears throat> we got it from Matt Rule. And so – uh, now that he's back at Nebraska, I kind of, I kind of feel like I've stole it. I tell him all the time, that's my dude. You know, he's he's uh, my mentor. But it's the toughest, hardest working, most competitive team in the country, and you know that's with everything. I mean, uh, we talk about it all the time. Uh, and the brand doesn't care. It doesn't man it doesn't care if it's hot. You got to go compete. It doesn't care if it's cold. Uh, we played in a uh, game that was twelve degrees against Iowa State. You know, you got to go play. You know, it's it's this consistent. Um, person in this consistent team that everything is we're going to go do tough things and we're going to get tougher you know um, we're going to work hard and then we're going to compete and you put all that stuff together and that's everything in your life we set the all-time high for the we had the highest GPA that Texas Tech football has ever had during the fall we had a 3.18 team GPA then we turned around we didn't beat that, but we had the highest spring Texas Tech's ever had, and we had a 3.08. What does that mean with the brand? We can compete in the classroom. Uh, we led the Big 12 last year and this year in community service, so we're com competing with it. all of that. It's just like you've heard it. It's kind of a slogan of some people of how you do anything is how you do everything, and that's the brand. And uh, we're not perfect. We're going to make mistakes. We're going to – you know, do things that, that uh, you know, we've got to get better at. But one thing we're going to do is we're going to be tough. We're going to work and, and we're going to compete our tails off. Well, Coach, I appreciate you so much making time to come on here. I know June is just craziness for y'all getting ready for fall camp and doing summer one. You got football school. But, I mean, the impact you've had, not just on me, but I'm sure so many that you've coached, uh, just reaches throughout the entire college football landscape. So we appreciate you. And we're fired up to watch y'all get after here in the fall pretty soon. Well, thank you, man. Thank you for having me on. And I'm fired up, man. I, I follow you like crazy. And man, it's it's impressive. And uh on three is lucky to have you and that crew in there. So man, y'all have a y'all have a great day. I appreciate you, man. Hey, we're just trying to live out the brand on our end here, coach. Dang right. Man, how do you not root for a guy like Coach McGuire, man? You know, like regardless of who you root for as a team, if you're rooting for people, that's a really good person to root for. So we'll leave it at that. But appreciate Coach McGuire coming on the show, breaking it down for us, chopping it up, talking some ball, talking some recruiting strategy, how they evaluate. That's going to be a big thing for Texas Tech now, too, how they evaluate and get the most out of their players. I think it's going to pay dividends for them for the coming seasons. So we are, needless to say, uh, very high on Texas Tech around here. Thank you all for tuning in. 
Thank you all for being a part of this. Thank you all for showing up each and every week, whether you're in live on YouTube at 10 a.m. Central, 11 a.m. Eastern, whether you're on podcast, taking us to work, driving in the car, whatever it is, man. We're very, very glad to have you all a part of this. Like genuinely, this deal with college football, it's so communal. And the way that it all, you know, brings us together in that sense, I think is special. And the way that y'all show up for this show in that same way, something that I'm grateful for and something that we are very, very proud of to have y'all a part of. All right. So without further ado, man, we're going to keep this party rolling. We will see y'all 